Welcome to the Elite Life Podcast. With your hosts, Trisha and Kylie. Here, we guide you on a journey of personal and professional transformation. Revealing the secrets to success. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out, join us as we unlock the doors to the elite world of growth, grit, and grace. So, let's dive in. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Elite Life Podcast. I'm Kylie, and here is my beautiful, wonderful, well-educated co-host, Trisha. And today we are going to run through a very important topic. That's right, Kylie. Today we will be laying out a guide to empower transgender individuals through their home buying experience. Navigating the process to applying for a mortgage and shopping for a home can be very intimidating. It it can be a stressful process. And if you are a member of the LGBTQ community, you may feel even more anxiety around proceeding with this life-changing undertaking. Um, and if you're transgender, you might decide to avoid it altogether because of the unknowns when it comes to credit and gender markers and identification and documents and just not knowing what what hoops you're going to have to jump through, and what's going to come your way. It just may be too intimidating for you. Um, so we want to kind of take some of that mystique away today and help to make it easier for uh, people to be able to navigate this system confidently. Absolutely. There's a lot going on there. So why don't we start out by having you break down um, the stats and figures? Yeah. So they were very interesting. When I started digging into the research for this episode, um, according to Fannie Mae, 49.8% of LGBTQ plus people own homes. However, when it comes to the trans community, Fannie Mae found that only 25% are homeowners. Um, the National Center for Transgender Equality reports that one in five transgender people have faced discrimination when seeking a home, and 34% of transgender folks have experienced homelessness at some point in their lives. 20% just in the past year due to being transgender, which like just gave me goosebumps. Like that is so it's just it's it's sad. So um, there's a lot of contributing factors to these numbers. And throughout this episode, we're going to unpack some of these by delving into the history of fair housing, LGBTQ plus economics, the home buying process, and just how to navigate these barriers when they arise so we can help more people become homeowners. Yeah, and understanding the present is often done best by taking a quick walk through the past. So the first step towards homes, um, you know, for, for all came via the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It's a federal law that said all U.S. citizens could buy and sell homes regardless of race or color. And then next up was the 1968 Fair Housing Act that prohibited discrimination based on race, color, religion, or national origin. And then in 1974, they added a provision for gender protection. And then it keeps going. In 1988, protection for people with disabilities and families with children. Um, and then it took it all the way until, uh, was it 2013, for HUD to add equal access to housing regardless, quote, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or marital status. And so finally, 2021, our very favorite person, President Biden, signed stronger laws to protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. And it blows my mind that these are even factors. Like these things should not even be a factor when you're coming to buy a house. Think about that though, 2013. So that means 10 years ago, somebody could go, oh, you're a single mom? Nope, sorry, don't want you. I'm not a fan of that. Ago. Nobody, like, listen. It's wild. Here's the, here's the bottom line, really. Nobody should be discriminated against, period. Yeah. Absolutely. And the story. I know. But here's the thing, right? Like, 
that's 100% true. But the reality of the situation is just because it's illegal to discriminate doesn't mean it's not done. I hear that. And it's it still persists in various forms. And like my professor, Scott Larson, shout out at U of M, um, he pointed out too that like enactment and enforcement can change with different administrations and at different levels, like state, federal, et cetera. And that just leads to like increased anxiety and uncertainty for minoritized buyers. So it's like, there are these laws, but like some places enforce them, some places don't. Like, you know, it's hard to prove that it happened. Right. Um, so, you know, hopefully, again, this episode just brings to light these problems and helps more people to be able to navigate it. Um, according to the LGBTQ Real Estate Alliance, 78%, 78% of LGBTQ plus people are afraid of sexual orientation discrimination. 36% of age discrimination, 34% race and ethnicity discrimination, 32% gender and gender identity discrimination. And Freddie Mac reports that 13% of LGBTQ plus home buyers did in fact, did in fact experience discrimination. And so like we're shouting out these these statistics which are high. And the other fact is is like we know that like not everybody reports this, right? So right. if 78% are afraid of it, that means probably like 90 are actually afraid of it, right? Like if 13% reported they experienced it, probably like 25-50% actually did. So very, very interesting. Yeah, when I found out those stats I really just, you know, digging into this research really affected me and, you know, I I firmly believe and we firmly believe and work hard to help everyone and anyone become a homeowner. So um, our hope is that we can make it so that the LGBTQ plus community and especially our transgender friends can enter the marketplace with confidence and the ability to protect themselves from this discrimination and predatory lending. And when more people know and understand the process, the variables, the barriers and how to remove them, then we can bring those transgender homeowners statistics up and improve their lives and experiences. And that's what we are all about here at the Elite Life Podcast is just making people's lives a little better every day in every way. So let's dive into this, right? Absolutely. So let's start at the beginning and we'll begin at the beginning. We always begin at the beginning. And <laughs> I wouldn't say that. Sometimes we're a little backwards. But um, the home buying journey for everyone, every single person starts I mean, unless you're throwing some cash around, but <laughs> we're going to talk really quick about the mortgage process. So uh, break that down for our listeners, Trish. Yeah. So I went, obviously, we know the mortgage process pretty well, but I did want to go and interview our friend Greg Goddard. He's the loan officer at Cross Country Mortgage. And he shared with me that by law, mortgage applications must be done in the homeowner's legal name, full legal name. So, um, you know, if you are a Dave, you can't, you have to, if you are David, you have to do David, not Dave, right? Um, if you are transgender, this can be especially traumatic because if you have a dead name, you will have to apply and sign with that name. So if you have legally changed your name, you should still know that when credit is pulled, your dead name may come up on your credit report under name variations, and you may be required to write a letter of explanation as to why your social security number pulls different than the name that you applied in. Now, this doesn't have to be like a huge letter. It can be as simple as when I was born, my parents named me Nancy, and I legally changed my name to Terry. This applies to anybody who has legally changed their name. Like when I applied for my mortgage, I have to put Trisha Aponte, which was my born name, Trisha Borschek, which was my previous marriage, and Trisha Dork, now that I am legally married again. So um, That's a lot of signing action. It is. It is. But I have to do an LOX on the different names that I have had because when you pull credit, they're there. Um, and, you know, just knowing that, that if you don't want to have to go through signing, if you want to sign the name that you go by now, you want to go and do the process to legally change your name, which we will leave links in the show notes um, that take you to the sites that teach you um, the resources and the places to go to do that. 
Awesome. So also important to know is the name change should not affect like your FICO score, you know, as financial lending is attached to your your social security number, not your name. So that's a plus. Yeah. Um, in the state of Michigan, you do not have to give your loan officer any identification unless you are applying for a government backed mortgage such as like FHA or VA or a rural development. So if you're getting a conventional mortgage and you have not updated the information that's on your license, you don't have to worry about this being an issue when applying for your loan. So however, you may want to apply for a government backed loan as they often require they, there's a lot of benefits, right? Yeah. There's less down or, you know, VAs, there's zero percent down altogether. Um, and uh, they're a lot easier to get approved for. So if you are working with fewer resources, it may be worth getting your license updated, which, again, like Trisha said, we'll leave we'll leave links in the notes. Yeah, and that's great info because a lot of people, when I was first um, talking about this with my professor, he he was wondering the same thing. He's like, you know, I have student loans in one name and I have, you know, these credit cards in another name. Like, how does that work? So that was really interesting information for me to find that um, since it's all attached to your social security number, you're good to go on that. Um, another thing we want to let you know about the application is they will ask for your marital status, your ethnicity, your sex, and your race. Um, HUD, which is the government uh, housing or er, housing urban development administration, they kind of run all the rules about government backed mortgages and fair lending and things like that. They say they do this for auditing purposes to make sure your lender is not giving loans like say to only cis white men, right? Um, or to only this one class or only this one race or only this one sex. And you can check the box that you don't want to provide this information. However, and I didn't know this, you should know that your loan officer has three spots that if they're taking a face-to-face -face application, they are asked, was the race, ethnicity, and sex collected matched based on visual observation? So this can feel awkward for all if you're presenting as one, but you prefer another. Um, so just make sure like you let your loan officer know up front. I was talking to Greg and I'm like, how how do you think is like easiest to navigate this? And he's like, just let us know, like, what are your preferred pronouns? How do you feel most comfortable navigating these questions? And they want you to feel comfortable. Like they want you to feel at ease and this to be a positive situation. Um, and we also want you to note that like when your loan application is input into the approval system, none of these factors are taken in consideration for loan approval or denial. The automated system gives its approval or denial based solely on your credit profile Finances. and your income. That's yeah. it. Credit and income. This is just to make sure that predatory lending doesn't happen because Greg actually gave me um, an example where there was a loan officer of a certain ethnicity and he was only lending to people of that in ethnicity because he was getting like kickbacks from them Aww. so it, it feels awkward and it feels evasive but there are actual good reasons for them asking those questions yeah and we're all just here to help again so like being up front and you know just saying hey here's how i'm most comfortable for what i want you to call me or you know pronouns and all of that stuff um we're all just trying to help like most people don't want to make other people uncomfortable. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we told you we, we wanted to make sure you guys have these resources. So check out the National Center for Transgender Equality online. They have a step-by-step -step breakdown and a checklist on exactly how to change your name, how to change your gender marker legally with every government agency and in every state because it is different. So if you'd like to do any of these things prior to mortgage application, which is what Greg suggested. Um, so you don't have to apply under your dead name or have any conflicting information. Um, or if you do want to get a government backed loan, you can work through their easy to follow roadmap. And like I said, they also have state specific guidelines. So you know what to do, where to go in your specific state. And the NCTE actually grade, grades each state on how easy it is to change your name and gender. Um, and we live in Michigan, and Michigan actually got an A for its ease of being able to make the changes you want with the state's various governing agencies. So Michigan makes it pretty easy. If you're in Michigan, um, it's not very hard to be able to go and change your name and your gender markers here. 
Oh, that's helpful. Yeah. So way to go, Michigan. Woo woo. Um, when I was researching for this podcast, I also found a lot of good info on um, Paisley Kura's site. So Paisley Kura is a trans activist, a professor, a writer who talks a lot about the different government agencies and how they use sex classification and reclassification in different ways and why some are easier to allow for reclassification and some are super against it. So Kura says DMVs, or as we call them, Secretary estates are one of the first and easiest to change your gender, um, which is helpful for trans folks as through the entire financing and home buying process. Like we said, the driver's license is the only identification document you will ever need at any given state. So when you make mortgage application, you may or may not need that driver's license. And then the only other time you need an identification document, which is kind of crazy if you think about it in general, um, is when you are at the closing table your title company will ask for your ID actually only because they're notarizing things. Right. Usually they don't even look at them. They grab the IDs and go to the printer and make, and make copy. copies. So making copies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting. But let's chat for a minute on the income piece before we move on um, from the pre-approval piece, shall we? Yeah, yeah. So some more statistics for us, like according to NAR, the National Association of Realtors, the LGBTQ plus community has $917 billion in home buying power in the U.S., $3.7 trillion worldwide. Um, but we know that the transgender community is a smaller portion of these big numbers as they face discrimination at an extremely elevated level in the job force and often have jobs that pay cash, which will keep them from being able to qualify for many loan programs. So if you have a job that only pays cash, we want to let you know to be sure to deposit all of your cash into a bank account Every time you get paid, you cannot use what loan officers call mattress money. Oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't just keep all your money in the safe and send. We've actually had home buyers send pictures of like $100 bills as their proof of funds. That does not work. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we cannot do that. Um, now, if you have a job that only pays cash and you do deposit all your cash in the bank account every single time you get paid, there are some programs that you can qualify for based based on bank statement deposits. Yeah, and these loans may have higher rates and require a little bit of a larger down payment, but you can always refinance, marry the house, date the rate, right? You, you can refinance down the road if you're able to get a job that has W-2s or if rates decrease. So. There's also a small number of loan options that have returned post some prime implosion, you know, where you can state what you make without having to prove it with income docs or like bank statements. But those loans do also come with higher interest rates for sure and larger down payments. And the borrower needs to have extremely pristine credit and scores. So there are pros and cons to these. But, um, you know, if home ownership is a goal, we want to give you all of the options. We just want to lay all the cards on the table. Yeah. I actually, the very first house I bought, I did a stated loan because I was a waitress. I was going to U of M <laughs> 20 year, 23 years she ago. She was going to be a doctor. I was going to be a doctor. And but here I, we are. And here we are. Elite Life Podcast. Um, but I was a waitress at three different restaurants when I was in college because Ann Arbor is expensive and <laughs> credit card. And holy crap. <laughs> we used to have to buy actual books, right? Ooh, um, I know. So I did a stated loan. So I had like a 750 FICO score and they're like, oh, you can just say what you make. And I'm like, what do you mean I can just say what you make? And they're like, yeah, just say what you make. One like, million it. dollars. Yeah. So um, so yeah, those loans, those loans are coming back. I was surprised to see them coming back, but they are coming back. So as long as you have great credit, you can do a stated loan, you can do a bank statement loan. And and now that we are through our pre-approval process, we get to the fun part and we get to go shopping. Yes. So currently we are in year three of a housing shortage. Thank you, COVID. Hashtag Biden. So <laughs> 
<laughs> but even though Trump, I'm pretty sure, was was in office, but everybody's just doing the best that they can. We're doing the best have. we can with what we have. So we're working with a housing shortage. So if um, a client likes a home, it is important to um, let your let your realtor know, like ASAP. So if you're cruising around, you're hitting that MLS um, uh, portal and your agent's sending you stuff and you like something, you want to J-O-B, jump on your business. And um, because the home could be, I mean, we've seen homes go in hours, yeah. um, just a couple of days. I, I am seeing that as we record this, I am seeing that um, slow down just a smidgen. Yeah. Um, so that's good news. So realtors are bound to a code of ethics and therefore prohibited from coaxing people towards certain neighborhoods or school districts or anything like that. So um, you as a client should be the one deciding what area feels safe, what area feels comfortable, making sure that you're in the school district you want to be in or you're close to the grocery store that you want to be in or you're out of a neighborhood you don't want to be in. That is 100% up to you. It's your job to make sure that it's a good fit for you. And when the home, um, you know, the home that you want um, to offer on is chosen, then the realtor will will craft an amazing offer for you and just walk you through all the tools in the toolbox. Make sure that we are putting your very best foot forward and um, negotiate, obviously, on your behalf to make sure your rear end is covered. And then once negotiations are completed, you move on to um, the due diligence period. So this can look a little different from state to state. So be sure to know and understand, you know, what the deadlines are, what the requirements are for inspections, appraisals, mortgage underwriting, um, and what is, you know, monetarily at risk at every single level. And you're, if you have a good agent, they will break it down for you. And if you're in Michigan and you want to buy something, you should give us a call shameless plug elite realty <laughs> elite realty um yeah so what we do at our office is we always go through a buyer's consultation with all of our clients so um buyers out there when you are choosing your realtor ask them if they do buyer's consultations with their clients because the buyer's consultation is the the sit down before you go out on the road to look at houses and that's where you get to lay out this is what's important to me um value of price for the quality of home i like these neighborhoods I need this in a house. This this is my price range. This is what I want. So everybody should understand. The buyer should understand the process. The realtor lays that out. The buyer's consultation, what you just went through. And then the realtor should understand the client's goals and needs. So having that buyer's consultation to start and then having you as the buyer drive by those homes. That's yes. really important too. Make sure as a buyer, you drive by the homes. I've had buyers like grab lunch and then sit on the block and like just watch the neighborhood like see if it's a quiet neighborhood see if people are outside see if people are walking their dogs like if it's important to you you want to be around other people that are doing the same things yeah. like I had some clients that were buying Royal Oak and they're like it's really important to us that the house, the city that we live in is very walkable. We want to, we don't want to be able to walk our dog to the dog park. We want to be able to walk up to the, to the, uh, cafe, to the pub, yeah. to the cafe, to get coffee. So um, make sure you drive by, make sure you spend some time in the neighborhood. And then like Kylie said, once you see one you like, jump on it. So mm. once you get your offer accepted, you're going to go into the underwriting process. And the underwriting process has a lot of safeguards in it for the buyer. So this is where it can feel kind of daunting because you get excited you got your offer accepted but then you have stuff to do there's stuff to do <laughs> so the first thing you do um is your inspection process so this you, is my favorite actually i love inspections do you I do. yeah you learn a lot on them for sure I, and it helps like it helps like if you're buying a house and you are able to be at the inspection be at the inspection because that inspector if they're a good one um is going to give you all of their insight. They're going to walk you through the house. They're going to tell you everything that's going on and make sure that after you have all that information, you still love the house. And if you do, you're going to want to know these things. Yeah. I learn stuff at inspections all the time that I didn't know for my own house. And I'll come home and I'll be like, Dave, have we changed the filter on our furnace? Have we went through our water treatment system and changed this? Have we put salt in our, you know? And so like, I'm always learning from our home inspection. So I like them because not only do our clients get to learn about the house and make sure it's safe for them, uh, 
Um, and then they get to know about like the life of the mechanicals yes. and things like that. One thing I do want to pop in there about inspectors, though, inspectors do not need to be licensed to right. be inspectors. So do not just Google home inspectors. Ask your realtor yes. for who they utilize in their business. Or if they don't have a list for you, which they should, but if they don't, um, make sure you ask your friend or family member if they know somebody that they know, like, and trust. Do not just Google and pick somebody random because literally today I could go and inspect a house, take your $700 or however much I want to I want to charge you for it and not know anything about actually inspecting a house. So make sure you get somebody that somebody else you know, like, and trust knows, likes, and trusts. Absolutely. And so once this is completed, your loan officer, uh, once we're past the inspection, let's say we love it, we we move on from that. Your loan officer is going to order an appraisal. So the appraisal is done by an unrelated third party, which is ordered through the lender to ensure that there's no tampering by the parties connected with the transaction. So the appraiser is who determines the value of the home in comparison with the other homes within a mile of the house that has sold in the last 180 days. So clients getting an FHA mortgage sometimes think that there is an FHA inspection. We talked about this a couple times in the past. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've, I've had to educate my clients on this too. Um, that's incorrect. The only thing that happens with an FHA appraisal is that there's an, an extra addendum um, that's added to the appraisal, which states that it's up to par with health and safety, like all the code, yada, yada, yada. And a uh, conventional mortgage can, um, you know, doesn't have to go through that. You can be missing fixtures or have messy paint. An FHA must have all the fixtures, the face plates, paint, cement, handrails, all the things have to be there. It has to have all of the things. And sometimes uh, some cities in Michigan also have city inspections. Um, and that will be done by a worker from the city, usually the building department. They will come in, they'll look for code violations, um, pests, stuff like that. Make sure you don't have rats and termites and all of those things. So each inspection and each report has a different purpose, but at the end of the day, they all safeguard the buyer's interest and make sure that they're making a sound investment in a good property. Yeah, and it's important. Like we're, I'm gonna put, um, we're gonna put a downloadable resource in the show notes that you can grab that like really breaks this down because I know this is gonna be lengthy and we're talking about a lot of different things. Um, but check out that downloadable resource because I'm gonna break it down into like you know 12 to 15 easy to follow steps. That's like get your pre-approval, ha you know, have your buyer's consult, do your home inspection, do your city inspection. Wait, wait, wait. Step one, call Elite Realty. There you go. If okay. you're in Michigan, we got that step first. <laughs> okay. We are going to take a very quick break. Let's and sit tight. Sit tight. We have a lot more really good information for you on how to finish out this process. Fair housing, all the Fair things. Fair housing, all the things, and lots of more tips and resources. So stay tuned. Did you know that over 80% of real estate agents call it quits within their first year in the business? It's a staggering statistic, but at MyStarsAcademy.com, we're here to change that narrative. Our expert-based training and coaching program caters to both agents and brokers. The Agent Accelerator Program is your key to leveling up your real estate business. Learn how to generate a constant flow of free leads, convert those leads into loyal clients, and keep them coming back for more as repeat business. Our industry experts bring years of proven success to the table and provide one-on-one -on -one coaching to help you achieve structure and work-life balance. We'll map out a plan for you to follow, guiding you through the steps to scale and grow both in your business and personal life. Don't become another statistic. Visit MyStarsAcademy.com and enroll today to pave the way for your future success. And we are back, friends. I love this episode because we are educating and informing and providing resources, which is our absolute favorite thing to do. And at this point, we are talking about different inspections you get throughout the home buying system. So while these different inspections are being completed, there are also multiple parties that are underwriting the borrower and the home. Um, lots of cooks in the kitchen throughout this process. Yes. <laughs> and so it's important to make sure you have professional chefs. Right? Yes, absolutely. I always tell everybody, I'm like, I know that it gets a little a little heavy during the underwriting process, but you're buying a home, not a hamburger. It's not going to be your way right away. 
I'm going to get that on a t-shirt for you. You're buying a home, not a hamburger. It, 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 I, I love it. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I get pretty technical about my hamburger. I'll tell you that right now. Right? So the title company, there's going to be a title company, and they are going to be going to the county and pulling what's called the chain of title to ensure the buyer buys the home with a clean and clear deed. They will be checking um, for public records filed by both the sellers and the buyers that could become liens on the property, such as marriages, divorces, deaths, bankruptcy, tax liens. All of these things can affect title. So these searches are necessary to be sure that both sides have handled any and all public record situations that could become liens on the property. That way, um, you know, I always tell my clients, like, <clears throat> once you close on a home, you don't want somebody coming and knocking down the door and saying, hey, my husband sold this home and I should have got half of the money. So now you owe me. The title company is who protects you from those things happening. And so. I would like to point out as well that not all title companies are created equal. That's true. There is a reason why we always use Epic Title. Not only do they answer phone calls at 9.30 p.m. on a Sunday, they also are very diligent. Everything's above board. And if there is an issue, they don't just say, oh, you have an issue. Have a nice life. They work to help you fix it. So make sure, again, that your realtor is hooking you up with a title company that is going to be on your team and go to bat for you. Yeah, absolutely. The the team that you choose is so important. And they definitely affect how this process goes. Absolutely. So, yeah. Once the title company searches are complete, they send an actual title report to the loan officer and the realtor um, and on there it'll have any things that need to be done like often I'll see like oh summer taxes need to be paid or give me a death certificate from George who passed away while the house was there or like a copy of the judgment of divorce if yep. there was a divorce involved yep absolutely so once the loan officer has the title report back they have their appraisal report the property reports the client's personal documents pay stubs credit reports letters of explanation all that good stuff. They package it up into a nice neat package and they send it to underwriting. Yay. So this underwriting package basically tells um, the bank like the who, the what, the where, the when, and the how of the home purchase. So the underwriter reviews each and every piece of documentation. And if there are any gaps, they will send over a list with conditions, which must be met in order to get your clear to close for the loan. So once all of those conditions are met, like we just talked about, need a copy of the divorce judgment, blah, 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 blah. Once all of those are met, the closing is set and the parties meet to sign final documents and exchange keys. Yay! Yay! Everyone's favorite part. It's closing day. Absolutely. We love closing day. Um, usually when you are getting uh, a mortgage from the time you sign that you are buying this house on a purchase agreement to the time you are sitting at the closing table, um, conventional mortgages are usually about 30 days. FHA mortgages, 30 to 40 days. If you are getting what's called MISHTA down payment assistance, there, there are down payment assistance programs that we didn't dive into, but definitely ask your loan officer or your realtor oh, yeah. about down payment assistance programs. Um, MISHTA down payment assistance program that we have in Michigan, they give like up to $10,000 towards your closing costs. That does make it take about 45 days to closing. So you're looking at anywhere from 30 to 45 days from the time you sign the purchase agreement until the time you're sitting at the closing table. Um, often here in Michigan, we're exchanging keys at the closing table, but occasionally if that seller of the house needs some time to get into their new house. They may be doing some occupancy, which means they may be staying a little bit of time after closing to pack up, get in their new house, and then you get the keys after that. Yeah. So um, just to give you some ideas of those closing timelines. Um, you want to talk about final walkthroughs too really quick because that's Ooh, something we want to touch on too. Those are super duper important. Um, so final walkthrough means that before the – be for the closing. So like if you have an early morning closing, you can do them in the evening. I personally try to do them as close to the closing as possible. So what this is, is you and your realtor go to the house and you walk through the house and you make sure it is in the exact condition as the last time you saw it. You want to make sure that as the seller's moving out, they're not leaving holes in the wall that are absolutely obscene. They're not taking the hot water tank because as soon as you sign those papers, it's done and over with like like 
everything's done. That is your house as is. So you need to make sure that before you close, you go with your realtor to the house, walk the house, and if there are any issues, you need to deal with those before the closing. Now, if the seller's having occupancy, like Trish just said, you do what's called a key exchange, same, same, different different name. So you're gonna you're gonna meet sometimes you meet the seller, sometimes you don't, but you're going to again at at the time you take possession, go over there, walk through the house, and if there's any issues, you take that up with with the seller. And one thing I will say that I did not do at the very beginning is if you're offering occupancy, you want to make sure that your realtor puts into the agreement that you're going to have a security deposit from the seller. So what will happen is the title company will say, oh, they'll see on the purchase agreement, oh, seller, we're holding $3,000 as a security deposit during occupancy. That way, if God forbid anything did happen while the seller was in the house during their occupancy, you have that $3,000 to lean on to fix it, repair it, replace it, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So lots of little safeguards to um, put in place. Make sure you go and you re-listen to the show. You use the downloadable resource. And we've gotten to the exciting high of closing day. And this is the best part of the journey. But there are just a couple more points that we have to make note of before we wrap this this knowledge journey up. Um, I know we've gone through all of these exciting things and mentioned a couple things that could be roadblocks. But we need to also recognize the major barriers the transgender community faces. Um, First and probably the biggest barrier I want to touch on is the economic struggle that the trans community faces. Um, Buying a home takes money. It takes money, it takes good credit, and a strong job history. And according to the NCTE survey, 19% of respondents in Michigan were unemployed and 30% were living in poverty. We know that the trans community faces um, housing insecurity at disproportionately high rates due to having disproportionate high rates of stigmatization, discrimination, educational challenges, economic insecurity, and job loss. And these major issues are often compounded when they intersect with other challenges that transgender folks often face, such as racism, health issues, family and social rejection, violence, harassment. Um, And these challenges and barriers can make it so that many transgender folks never even get a shot at being homeowners. So if a transgender individual cannot get there alone, we did find some alternative options that can help. Yeah, some things that the um, some things that the community is great at that can be evoked in this scenario is collective action and mutual aid on a small or on a larger scale. So on a small scale, you can have up to four borrowers on a loan at one time. So this means that four unrelated, unmarried individuals can go in together and buy a home, um, which is amazing. Um, the Our pro- family did this. Uh, Aunt Cindy, Uncle Tony, Grandma and Grandpa. Yeah. All four of them went in and bought their house together. Absolutely. And the process looks exactly the same as what we outlined already with zero extra steps. Um, the only thing that you will want to make note of and plan for is title vesting. So anytime two or more people buy a home together, you must decide how you want to take title. So if, for example, two people um, buy a house, when one dies... You want the home to automatically go to the other with no probate needed, like no courts involved. Then you must vest as John Smith, a single man, and Robert Jones, a single man, quote, joint tenants with full rights of survivorship. That's the key right there. That's the key. must say the full rights of survivorship. Yes. The full rights of survivorship means that whoever is left gets the other share. So if there were three people, the remaining two now have it. And then when there's one that's the sole owner, that person gets it. So if you do a collective for borrowers and perhaps each wants their share to go to their own family, then you just put it only as joint tenants or tenants in common. So then if one dies, that person's equity passes to their heirs, not to the remaining people on the title. So if you're not sure what you want to do, you can always dig deeper into it with your real estate agent or have a chat with an attorney to get a little bit more advice on the best way to go. Yeah, that's great info, Kylie, because everybody needs to know that. Like anytime you're buying a house with another person, this is a huge investment. Yeah, and friends buy houses, boyfriends, girlfriends buy, buy houses together. The all uh, People who are not married buy houses together. <laughs> all the time, all the time. So anytime you're buying a house with another individual, this is something that should be broached and it's missed 
all the time. Yes. All the time. So how you vest title is very important. Um, so that's on a smaller scale. Scale You can collectively four people buy. Um, and then on a larger scale, we also see trans-led organizations and collectives buying large multifamily homes, apartment buildings, and group homes to house trans community members. So this started way back in Stonewall era by Sylvia Rivera when she had Star House. And it has continued by organizations like House of Tulip in New Orleans, My Sister's House in Memphis, Atlanta's Trans Housing Coalition, and trans housing programs, which all provide long-term housing solutions to trans people in their cities. So Google your city and um, collective housing, trans-led organizations for housing, and you will likely find one either in your area or near your area where collectives are buying, buying these houses and helping to house so there is less homelessness in the trans community. Yeah. Wow. We covered a lot of ground today. We did cover a lot of ground. And I learned so much in researching for this show. And I'm so grateful to be able to arm our listeners, fellow realtors, people in the communities with this information to just make the world and the future a better and brighter place for our transgender friends and people that are looking to buy homes in the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah, so that's what we've got for you today. I just, that's the end. That's the end. That's it. <laughs> so make sure to, like Trisha said a couple times, grab your downloadable resources. Check out the show notes because we're throwing a lot of links in there with some great information. Um, we're going to give you easy steps to follow in the in the home buying process. And thank you again so much for um, joining us today on Elite Life. Like we know that there's a lot of places you can get your information um, and your entertainment. I like to think that we're entertaining. I hope so. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> This is a super special episode, and so we are super glad that you're listening, and please make sure you subscribe, leave a review, leave, leave, uh, leave a review. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, friends. We <sighs> will see you every Thursday for a new episode of The Elite Life. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today on the Elite Life Podcast with Trish and Kylie. Don't forget to share this episode with a friend so we can keep delivering you more fantastic insights on grit, grace, and growth. Stay connected with us on Instagram and Facebook, where we'll keep the ideas flowing to help you build a life you love and leave a legacy you can be proud of. Until next time.